Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Unbox Lunch. Before we get started, please know that this event is being recorded. I'm Jenny Williams, Associate Director of the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian Institution, and we are thrilled you're joining us for lunch. Josh T. Franco, Head of Collecting, will soon join us and we'll explore uh, the papers of um, Lucy Lepard. This is an addition to um, the Lucy Lepard papers that um, were already here at the Archives of American Art. A few housekeeping items. At any point during the webinar, you can submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Closed captioning is available. You can ask, access captions by clicking the CC button at the, um, at the bottom of the uh, control panel. Now I'd like to introduce and welcome my colleague, Josh Franco. Hey, Josh, happy Friday. Hi, Jenny, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. It's a very sunny Friday in DC here. Um, good to see a lot of friends in the attendee list. And yeah, I'm really happy to share uh, this new edition. So as Jenny mentioned, you know, Unboxed is always about very recently arrived collections. Uh, many of you have probably used and visited and consulted the Lucy Lepard papers, which have, um, been here since their first installment in the early 70s, actually. And uh, yeah, this edition, so there's currently 70 linear foot feet. A linear foot is a banker's box. That's our basic unit of measurement um, that are accessible and available. Um, this new edition adds about 18 linear feet to the collection. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to get into it. A uh, couple of notes first. Um, I spoke with Lucy earlier this week. She is up against writing deadlines. So I will center the recording later and pass along any greetings in the chat. Um, so feel free to say hi there and hi Lucy when you watch this later. Um, and I also want to just give a shout out to Stephanie Ashley. So Stephanie is the processing archivist here at the archives who, um, you know, did the meticulous organizing and writing the finding aid of that existing 70 plus linear feet uh, and will most likely uh, manage the rest of this, organizing this new edition as well. It's a good moment to point out, uh, as I always like to, that myself and the curatorial team, we decide what comes to the archives uh, and do the initial assessing of research value of collections. Uh, but then we hand it over to our colleagues in processing who have, um, very specialized uh, and well-earned training in information science and library science who produce those beautiful finding aids and do all that amazing organizational work that makes um, exploring the papers, you know, as easy as possible and as, um, as productive as possible when you come to our reading room or go online to look at digitized things. Um, so I have a box here. So Collection, I've, you know, there's the trend in, in Lepard's papers are really to be organized either by an individual artist files or by project, um, whether that's a book project or a curatorial project. Um, so I brought out six examples of, of uh, all of both of those. I'm going to start with a box that's organized primarily by individual artist. Um, this is the Kusama folder uh, that's in this recently arrived edition. Um, Yayoi Kusama, Japanese foreign artist, had a uh, you know early important part of her career in the U.S. and New York, and now works uh, consistently from Japan currently. Um, this also just speaks to the you'll see as we go to the breadth of Lucy's uh, interest and why her collections are both so vast but also so consulted. Out of our six thousand plus collections, they perennially remain in the top five, often the top collection uh, that gets the most requests in a given year um, because of just the vast amount of uh, topics and interests that Lucy has and writes so wonderfully about. Um, so there are things in here, you know, there are press clippings as Lucy sort of keeps track of a certain artist's career and big developments. And this will, so this is a good example too of what we'll, you know, kind of call a raw document. This will be, um, you know, flattened or more carefully folded and interleaved by the processor when they get to it. Uh, this is a 1998 uh, New York Times, looks like, uh, feature on Kusama. There's more press clips. There's also this, this is really valuable uh, because, you know, we see besides being publisher, writer, and curator often gives many public engagements. Um, here's a really nice, you can see, let me see if I can get it. There you go. 
Um, so clearly notes from a panel or, you know, to deliver at a panel at MoMA in 98 about Kusama. And then all these great handwritten notes, um, this annotations kind of updating her own work, you know, perhaps on the fly as the, the, the seminar was happening, um, perhaps just before. So yeah, it's hard, sorry. I start looking at this and kind of just want to get into it myself. Um, and then here's this really special letter. So correspondence, you know, is our bread and butter at the archives. Um, everyone in the world, it seems, writes to Lucy Lepard at some point. Um, so it's a treasure trove for this direct voice of the artist often. So here's a letter from Kusama. I just have to show off this great typeface um, of her stationery, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, again. So here's the letter. And feel free to drop questions in. Jenny will be watching that and we'll speak up um, as we go. So let me read the, the first kind of paragraph of this and then I'll explain why there's many layers of specialness to this. Uh, Dear Miss Lepard, I hope this letter finds you very well. I was very shocked at the death of Mr. Donald Judd. Uh, this is October 24th, 1994, by the way. And she writes, it is a pity that he died so young, leaving so many important works unfinished in Texas, I would imagine. Whenever he visited Japan, I met him. I remember his lecture on the plan of his museum. Um, so if you know a bit of history, you know, this, this network of artists, uh, this is a really meaningful letter. And I'll, you know, add also before I worked at the Smithsonian, I worked at Judd Foundation at 101 Spring Street as an artist guide. Um, so there's a little extra special kind of aspect of this to me personally. Uh, but if you've read Infinity Net, Kusama's autobiography, she has, uh, her chapters are mostly organized by um, artists who are important to her, who she interacted with, who she knew. So there is a Donald Judd chapter and it has this really charming vignette of um, recalling a moment when they lived in the same building on 19th Street in New York City. Judd lived on the floor above Kusama. Uh, Kusama was cooking potatoes one day and using onions, and Judd comes down to complain about the smell of the onions. Um, they were very good friends by, you know, the account in that book, and, you know, it's kind of implied in this letter. Uh, Judd was one of the early viewers of her, you know, her infinity paintings, which are so seminal and significant both then and now uh, in the history of 20th century art. Um, so this letter just kind of, you know, it's like a time warp because uh, the last, the text I knew about their relationship was the autobiography speaking to the, you know, late 60s, early 70s, coming across this letter from 94 um, at the passing of Judd, which was you know, very, many of you probably know, very uh, sudden and unexpected. Um, it's just a really touching kind of thing to encounter. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave that there. It's one of those things that would make a great article, um, you know, based on almost one document alone, if anyone wanted to do it. The rest of the letter is very much about art business. She's catching Lucy up on, uh, you know, representing Japan at the Venice Biennial last year. So that would be 93, uh, and telling her about the museums and galleries reaching out to her, um, and about an upcoming Guggenheim show uh, at Guggenheim Soho when that, that existed. Um, so it's amazing. It's her signature, which is always fun to see. Yeah. So let me gently put that back. We'll keep going. Josh, you mentioned that the folders are organized by artists. Is that, that's um, Lucy's organization? Yeah, so right now, yeah, like again, this is new. This has not been, I've done some, uh, you know, waiting for duplicates uh, and things like that, but otherwise it's pretty untouched. Um, so, so for instance, this folder itself, when, when the processor, probably Stephanie, um, you know, gets to it, will put this in one of our acid-free folders, but echo the label on it. Um, so, you know, it's important to keep the folder for now at this stage, because it contains, you know, this is information. Um, so it contains information. So it's important uh, to leave that intact until the processors get to the material. Yeah, good question. Uh, here's a Jacob Lawrence folder. Let's see what that has. 
rest of this is going to be very spontaneous. I really uh, wanted to teach him that he saw the letter because I just thought it was there's a lot of striking things about it. Uh, but let's see what we find from here on. So again, press clippings. Uh, oh, this is nice. So this is a uh, mailer for a Jacob Lawrence exhibition uh, and Glenn Knight as well. And it's at DC Moore Gallery. So this is the gallery of um, Bridget Moore, one of our board members here at the archives uh, who we appreciate very, very much. And is a great, um, great ally, you know, member of the archives. Um, so, you know, this is great. Lots of these are, these kinds of things, you know, it's not, it maybe doesn't have the aura of a special letter, but it has lots of good information. Um, so this is a very information rich document with date, you know, names, dates, locations, uh, which is always helpful for researchers. More press clippings. Great photograph of Lawrence of Mailer for a show at MoMA. Just a friendly reminder for guests to um, insert any questions into the Q&A. So I'll move over to um, this other box. So we're gonna move from individual artists, organized files to um, these files which are some of Lucy's uh, gathered research correspondence writing related to outsider art. Um, so we're going a bit afield from Kusama and minimalism in the mid, you know, the 60s and 70s in New York to, um, I think Maine actually, here's, so then there's, it's interesting how regional, you know, non, not LA, not New York, not Chicago, regional, regionally based artists cross over with outsider artists. And it, this is these are all the issues unpacked by scholars um, for many years now, very recently, or somewhat recently in um, the show Outliers at the National Gallery really tackled and refreshed these questions when Cook curated that. Uh, so here's just new material for that conversation to continue, which I know many of you, many of our researchers are very interested in. Um, fellows upstairs at Sam at the American Art Museum. I know there's a couple this year that are, this is their focus as well. Um, this is interesting. So handwritten document, I'll read a little bit. Again, I haven't, I haven't like stopped to look at this yet, so we'll figure out what it is together. Uh, June 9, 2007. Dear, dear Carolyn, love Lucy's essay. I love Lucy. She says it's so right. Uh, so this is something somebody sent someone else that then they copied. Looks like a Xerox actually and sent to Lucy. I found myself underlining uh, some lines, awesome lines. Um, oh, that's interesting. They talk about a type, a typo they caught, a misspelling of the word lobster. That's very funny. Uh, yeah. It looks like they're dealing with some other publication business. Yeah, so this is an essay contributed for something at the University of Southern Maine Art Galleries. That I assume was outside about art side art. Okay, here's an article, manuscript, Common Dreamers. Yeah, okay, so super interesting there. Some postcards. Um, and this says, hey, Lucy, just found your dates of arrival to Maine, was thinking about you, got here July 23rd. Um, see, now you said July 27th. Yeah, so this is about arranging a visit in Maine. Uh, that's the, yeah, that's a good aspect of many people's papers, Lucy's as well, the <laughs> where artists, critics, art historians travel. Um, archives are very useful for travel, for you can kind of like, you know, if you're really dedicated, you could sit down with a, a set of papers, look at correspondence and other documents and kind of figure out on a map where people were when. Um, and you never know what that re would reveal when you do it for multiple people and see where they crossed over, um, where they missed each other. Josh, yeah. who was the postcard from? That is from, oh, so it's signed Carolyn. So let me, you know, put this together with this other document. 
And this would be Carolyn. She seems to not put her last name anywhere right here, but it's probably in there. I assume she's either the curator or staff at Southern Maine Art Galleries, just from working through here quickly. Oh, Carolyn Shoot, uh, because Lucy's manuscript here uh, opens with a quote from Carolyn Shute. The soul of the artist is sticky and picks up everything it sees and feels and spins and spins it into music, images, verse, and stories like a pearl is made. So that's very nice. I'm not familiar with Shute, so clearly an art, another art scholar, critic, writer. So if anyone um, is, feel free to drop a note uh, here in the chat. Here's some photographs. Oh, this is great. So this must have been some of the art being considered in this project that you see installed here in the landscape. And if you are interested in outsider art, you know it's often installed in yards and landscapes. Um, and the idea of it being made, you know, targeted at museums and galleries is kind of a secondary aspect of most of it. Um, I recently was at the Kohler Art Center in Wisconsin. Uh, which is amazing if you're interested in this field. And there you see like whole yards and even whole homes brought from their original location, reinstalled in this cavernous space that Kohler has in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Uh, but they also map, they also sponsor sites and leave them in place. Uh, so this looks like a place that, um, that would fit that category. And again, this is in Maine. Unbox is very funny because it's like you're doing research that's very uh, inchoate and raw for an audience. Uh, so I hope you'll enjoy it. Okay, so Philip Day, Bath, Maine. So this is very helpful. There's an annotation on this. Um, you know, my first assumption is that's the artist. So I would continue thinking about that and digging for more documents to verify that. Um, but here's a great example of yard art in Maine. You see a tractor. Uh, there's a man riding an elephant. So yeah, I'm very interested in outsider art, so I could keep going through this folder forever because I actually have not explored it in Maine very much myself. Um, and the folder here again, like this physical folder might be replaced uh, when the processor gets to it, but this information would be kept intact. So the fact that uh, Lucy uses the word vernacular is significant. So in this field, you know, the terminology is very, very, very fraught and debatable. You have words like vernacular, outsider, outlier, folk artist, um, visionary artist is another one. Uh, so it is significant that this folder is labeled with vernacular. Oh, Judith, thank you so much. So Carolyn Shute, contemporary Maine-based writer, best known early works, Beans of Egypt, Maine, winner of Penn New England Award. Fantastic, thank you. Josh, could you tell us a little bit about um, the additions and what that means? Yeah, so, you know, this is a good example of kind of lessons learned. Um, Lucy's relationship with the archives and donating papers, as I mentioned, began really just barely a decade after the archives was founded. Um, and Catherine Morris notes that Lucy spent summers in Maine for decades, yes. Um, uh, and uh, we always welcome her papers, uh, you know, and Lucy knows this, I work with her and her assistant Mira often um, on these installations. Um, you know, generally we you know, request like, there's a few things when, when we are, you know, have, starting a conversation about papers, um, you know, are you, are you using them? If you're using them still to write books, to curate very actively, you know, we discourage, yeah, and, we won't consider them right away because we don't want to disrupt that ongoing work. Um, that's why these projects are, you know, these are things Lucy's published shows that are done uh, when she sends them. Uh, and we try to streamline the paperwork for the registrar, the processors. Uh, we want kind of as long of a gap as possible between editions. Um, they will always be considered. Uh, but the timing might be, you know, we might ask to wait uh, another year or so. Um, Jenny, you know, our workload, it's a big country, we're bold into all of it. Um, and we have 
the collectors have many, many cases, which means the processors have many, many collections to process at once. Um, the pandemic certainly didn't help. Uh, so we're always working and there's just a vast kind of quantity we're dealing with. Um, so additions are just, yeah, they, they're what they sound like. They're a collection we already have, uh, but the person's still generating uh, work as is the case with Lucy and then we work. Um, before the pandemic, and I hope to pick up again, it was, I took at least a, one trip a year out to New Mexico. Uh, to It's really helpful to be on site, of course, and look directly at things with Lucy and Mira um, together. So actually I should be planning that for the summer. Uh, so Lucy, look out for for me to invite myself over. Um, yeah, did that, I hope that explained it a little bit. Jenny. Yes, definitely. All right, so I'm gonna to go to a publishing project now. So these are research files, correspondence uh, related to Overlay, which is Lucy's book about the kind of intersection uh, of contemporary art and prehistoric art. So really looking at um, you know, many case studies and examples of art, contemporary artists who incorporate prehistoric imagery, methods, materials, um, so, and it's a very, you know, it's in, you know, I, that book is great. I love that book. Um, I relied on it a lot for many, many reasons. And it's incredible how it's one of those things where like, it took Lucy to kind of point it out in this book for you to realize how deeply prevalent it is. And it really um, changes your sense of the scale of time because it really kind of it examines and closes in a way the distance between um, an artist working in the 1980s or now, and the artists who put things on cave walls, um, you know, using like plant liquid and hematite uh, 10, 12, 20,000 years ago. Um, so it's a really fascinating book if you want to have like a real time warp kind of experience. Um, I really, yeah, like that book a lot. So I just grabbed a folder. Let's see what we find. Correspondence immediately, great. Uh, there's a last name on the return address, Becker. And this is to Lucy when she lived in New York. Oh, this is nice. So yeah, this includes a slide that certainly dates this correspondence as well. This is Arlene Becker sending a small work sample and a letter. And yeah, so this is, you know, about this topic after, um, this is Arlene Becker writing, after looking at a lot of ancient art and naive art, which is another good term in that pool of terms I mentioned earlier, uh, I came to the conclusion that I'm not list interested in lifting the imagery or mannerisms of these forms as artists, as artists often do. But what I want to lift and learn is how these artists open their pathways of intuition. Okay, so that's fascinating. I already want to sit down and write an article about that. What does it mean to take a method for building your intuitive capacity rather than taking form, uh, formal inspiration from prehistoric artists? Um, the pathways between nature and human activity of tremendous help and influence has been reading about Taoism, the ancient form, not the more recent cult forms. In doing the circular pieces, I merely tried to surround myself with natural materials within a man-made structure and think, or rather unthink, and then feel in question mark, uh, in parentheses, about basic primordial matters, which, when unrealized, often sound like cliches. Birth and death, time and matter, space, feelings and actions, call it Tao or universal or seeing or knowledge, and then let happen what will. Okay, I think that's fascinating. I hope you agree. Um, again, just to remind, we have a question. Sure. A reminder about what folder this was found in. So this folder, so a lot of things are um, often unfoldered. And this okay. looks like, uh, in my, so this is one of our folders that we get, this is acid free archival grade. Um, so this was a case of just getting a box of a lot of loose material and then building some kind of basic order and Stephanie or the pro whoever works on this will make it um, 
you know, we do know the, the boxes labeled outsider art. Uh, Lucy often sends the uh, things in boxes that are labeled by the whole box rather than folders inside. Um, so that looks like it was the case here. And then just to build some kind of basic organization, I used a few of our folders uh, to organize things. That's a great letter. You're going to keep it and read the whole thing later, aren't you? I mean, I wish I had the time. <laughs> <laughs> this, I, I talked to the other collectors about this and processors about how often we see so much amazing material. Uh, and we're very happy to support others capacity to sit for hours and think about it. Um, but unfortunately, that's not possible for us. You know, the trade off is we get to see a lot and it's always amazing. So it's not uh, nothing to complain about. We certainly have time for one, maybe one more folder. Uh, my mom said hi. Hi, mom. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah, let's, oh, this one looks good. This is just a good image. Marsha Adams, Barbara T. Smith. Uh, on the back, there's all that good, this hard data we like. This is Barbara T. Smith and Marsha Adams, uh, a meeting place, an exhibition of static work and radial land speak, a performance piece by Smith and Adams, April 6th to 24th, 1988. Oh, and then there's a handwritten note here on the back. Um, I'm reproduced in overlay, uh, have been doing a great deal of research and using overlay heavily for resources in my art performance class rooted in ceremony and rituals. Thank you. So then I assume this is either from Smith or Adams. And they sent it to, to Lucy. And the gallery was Pepper's Art Gallery at the University of Redlands in Redlands, California. We have a question um, that I apologize, Jeffrey, that I missed um, about any files on activism or feminist art. Oh, for sure. Um, so I know, I think I see Allison Sines in the attendees list who's been looking really closely the last few weeks, months at, um, and this is in the existing, the already accessible papers um, about Lucy's activism in Latin America and Central America, especially. Uh, a lot of people come to us for those, uh, for Lucy's um, activism in Central America. Um, so that's definitely there. Feminism is like kind of threaded throughout everything. Um, there's definitely specific projects and artists that you would want to look at that are here if you want to think specifically about feminism and feminist art. Um, yeah, that's a great question, and there's tons. And I, you know, defining it as online uh, of what's already here. So definitely just look through that, search the key terms you're interested in. I'm sure feminism will appear there. Um, you know, Allison, if you want to drop any nuggets about Central American activism discoveries in the chat, please do. And a question about when this, um, the schedule for the processing of this edition. Yeah, so uh, it's deeded. The next step for me is to accession it, which, you know, just to be very honest, might take a few weeks. Uh, like I said, we're quite uh, on the verge of overwhelm, but we, we will manage. Um, we're committed and we will do that. Um, so a few weeks for me to accession it and then uh, processing from there. Uh, once it's accessioned, it's listed online and you could request to look at it in the reading room in this raw form. So you could do that then. Um, for it to get the finding aid and get the meticulous organizing done, um, typically, you know, maybe another year or so, maybe more. Yeah. So we have just a minute or so left if you wanted to offer any final um, remarks on Lucy and. Oh, and Toby just dropped in the Q&A, so maybe we can, here, I'll copy that into the chat. Thank you, Toby. Toby is our amazing uh does computer and internet and website stuff along with Michelle Herman here at the archives. Um, so here's a good piece. Oh, sorry, that went to just hosts and panelists. I'll, I'll, I'll copy. Thank that. you. Uh, about Lucy from the archives related to Lucy and feminism. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Josh, and thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed the program as much as I have. 
uh, please uh, mark your calendar for our next Unbox Lunch, which will be on March 24th. Thank you all.